I'd like to say is that um, our ancestors were multi-organismal, that is associated with a microbiome before they were multicellular, that is ancestral to being an animal. So we really should be expecting, and as we're getting, conservation of these interactions right across the animal kingdom. I mean, there's no reason. I mean, they have a, we have a full plot um, ahead. Are you doing okay? Or? Of course. I hear something okay? over the intercom. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure whether that's a question. Shall we yeah. hold those yeah. till the? Yeah. Okay. Great. There's the disinvited <laughs> voice of, of who? Jeff Gordon. Jeff Gordon. Jeff Gordon. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So uh, let's thank Angela for that wonderful talk. And uh, we're now going to uh, swim downstream into the ocean oh my uh, for microbiome uh, uh, studying fish with Karen Julema from the University of Oregon. Okay. Great. And actually, if you could restart this again, there should be a movie playing. Or, or play the movie. Thank you. Yes. So um, thanks very much for this uh, invitation to this really important meeting. And uh, what um, I hope you got just a little flash of was a movie of the gut bacteria inside a zebrafish larva. So I'm going to be talking about our work with nonobiotic zebrafish. And, um, uh, and there's some particular strengths and challenges of this, this model uh, that, that I'd like to share with you today. So, um, the, uh, you know, as we've been talking about in this meeting, um, we really need to think of each of ourselves as a, a unique interacting system of hosts and microbial cells. And, and so, uh, you know, a challenge then is to try to understand the biological implications of, of these complex interactions. And um, uh, what I want to tell you about today is our use of uh, developing the zebrafish model as a system to do this. So zebrafish are a vertebrate system, and um, they share uh, some of the, um, the, the strengths of some of the systems you've heard about already today um, in sort of the, the high through capacity. They also have... Um, some uh, more uh, complexity in the kinds of microbial um, communities that they harbor. Um, again, in this, this talk, I'm going to be focusing mostly on um, the bacteria, which is what we know most about. Um, I, and I want to, in this talk, highlight um, some specific strengths of this model um, and give you some examples then of how um, uh, we've performed experiments that take advantage of these strengths to, to gain new insight. So one strength of, of the uh, zebrafish model is the fact that we can work with very large numbers of individuals and we can control their associations in defined environments. And, then, and this has then allowed us to start to ask questions about uh, a transmission of microbiota across individuals. Another strength is the optical transparency of the animals, which really allows us to look at dynamics of microbial communities in real time inside um, living organisms. And then the third is um, the accessibility of these animals to, to looking at early development. So these are uh, vertebrates that develop ex utero and um, allow us to look um, at, and exploit all of the resources that have been developed with this model system as a model for looking at development. I also just wanted to touch on some of the challenges uh, so one challenge is uh, uh, in rearing older germ-free animals. So what I'll be talking about today um, when, I, when I talk about the notobiotic experiments is largely looking at um, notobiotic larval zebrafish. And that is very easy to do. Again, it's, it's a matter of um, using bleach and iodine to surface sterilize the chorion of the animals, and we can do that in large numbers. But the challenge then, if we want to um, rear those animals beyond the period where they have their endogenous egg yolk as a source of nutrients, is um, then the nutritional requirements of the um, juvenile and adult zebrafish are really um, uh, rather poorly understood. And so, um, so we, we do a lot of experiments where we're looking in the larval period and we don't add exogenous food. But um, we're also working hard on developing the husbandry methods to, to rear older animals, and those are still challenges because of our lack of understanding of the nutritional requirements. Um, another challenge uh, unique to our system is a concern about maintaining water quality. 
And um, the microbes in the ecosystem actually play a really large part normally in conventional animals in detoxifying um, urea waste and so forth. And so now we need to actually, you know, manipulate the water quality um, with, with more frequent water changes and so forth. So that's another particular challenge to our system. And then the other um, so flip side of, of the, the um, rearing germ-free animals is how to deal with the control animals, so standardization of um, conventional zebrafish. And this touches on some of the points that, that um, Skip has already raised. And so this is something just as a newer field we're, we're grappling with. So we don't, at this point, have a defined inoculum of Shadler's flora um, equivalent for zebrafish. We um, have a, a large curated collection of bacterial isolates, we really have not delved into, here we have a few fungi that we've isolated, we haven't um, delved into isolating uh, viruses, for example. So, so we don't, we, we have some of the component parts, but we haven't defined communities that have been um, um, embraced by the entire uh, research community, and it's an ongoing um, area of development. And then another um, aspect of um, zebrafish research in general is that we don't have as well standardized methods for screening for pathogens. So we don't have sort of the equivalent of a specific pathogen free. There's, there's a one group at um, Oregon State University that, that has a SPF facility where they screen for a couple of pathogens. But in general, we have uh, less standardized uh, practices around that. So, um, but now I want to show you some of the strengths of the system. And, and one of the strengths, um, I think, is this fact that we um, can work along a real uh, scale and um, a spectrum of complexity of host microbe interactions. So we can um, look at a very complex community of microbes. So zebrafish harbor hundreds of different bacterial species and um, presumably, although really less characterized, other uh, microorganisms. Um, so a similar type of complexity to mammals. Um, but uh, the fact that we can derive them very easily under germ-free conditions, and, uh, and again, we can, um, it's, it's a very straightforward matter to derive hundreds of individuals at a, a, a time um, through surface sterilization of the, of the embryos, um, then allows us to build up more simple communities, mono-associations or di-associations and so forth. And so then that allows us to work very readily along this um, scale of complexity. And so what I'm going to be telling you about is three short vignettes at different places along this complexity. Um, so the first one I want to tell you about how we're looking and, and embracing the full complexity of um, of the um, uh, naturally assembled microbiomes of our laboratory fish. And I should say that we've also done profiling of wild-caught fish, and we see a lot of similarities between our lab-reared and our, our wild-caught fish. But we, we work with lab-reared fish. But we can, um, in these experiments, uh, manipulate the associations of the fish and see how that impacts the assembled communities that we observe. And so, um, so this is this looking at these, these, these fish in populations. And, um, and this is an experiment um, that was carried out by a very talented PhD student co-mentored by my colleague, Brendan Bohannon, um, Adam Burns here, who just uh, defended his thesis this summer. And he was interested in the assembly of microbiota in um, both immunocompetent wild-type fish and immunodeficient MyD88 um, uh, mutant fish, and, um, and wondered how um, the host genetics, but also host-host interactions might impact um, the communities that are assembled in, in um, these individuals. So um, he performed an experiment where um, he varied the kinds of inter-individual uh, host interactions that, um, that could be observed. So he had uh, flasks of fish in which um, he also housed both wild-type and mutant zebrafish. Um, he also had, on the other extreme, solitary fish um, isolated in single um, flasks, and he controlled for the volume um, and the surface area they experienced. And then um, he also had segregated uh, uh, flasks where it was just a single um, uh, genotype of host, um, but equ equivalent density as um, in uh, the um, mixed flasks. And um, he uh, made the following observations. When he looked broadly at the composition of the microbiota that assembled um, in these different hosts. So in the solitary fish, um, there was a very stark contrast in the uh, communities that were observed in the wild-type hosts versus the immunocompetent MyD88 
uh, deficient hosts. When we look, uh, he looked at the mixed uh, hosts together, now you see a convergence of these microbial communities. So there's an um, a indication of a sort of swapping of the, uh, by, by inner host transmission of this difference um, driven by genotype. And this is something that's been observed um, in other systems, including mice. What was really surprising to me and striking is that if he looked at the genotypes where they were um, isolated by genotype but co-housed, you see this same kind of um, convergence of the microbiota to this similar community that's seen in the mixed genotype. So this would say, regardless of the genotype, there's a convergence of microbiota when, when hosts are co-housed. And something that's very um, intriguing, if you look at um, the predicted genomes of, the, uh, of these bacteria that are enriched in the co-housed situation, um, and this, uh, using a, um, a different predictive algorithms, uh, what one sees is that there's an enrichment of uh, bacterial gene functions associated with transmission um, and um, hemotaxis. And so that what that's implying is that the, the actual co-housing of hosts is homogenizing the microbiomes and it's selecting for uh, me bacterial members that are transmissible. And so in other words, another way to think about that is that isolation of hosts actually causes extinction of bacterial lineages that who have the strat ecological strategy of transmitting between hosts. And so this is really, I think, has um, large implications for thinking about how one designs experiments profiling microbiota that the housing conditions can have very profound effects. Okay, now I wanna talk about um, looking at microbial communities where we have defined members, um, in this case a dye association, and, um, and this is one where we're taking advantage of the transparency of the zebrafish to be able to look um, in real time at, at the growth um, and dynamics of the, the, the bacteria. And so that was just a, a single movie where you could see growth from an initial inoculum of a few bacterial cells that we could count um, into a, a large, robust population, about 10 to the fourth cells. And the growth dynamics um, is very characteristic. It would look a lot like how the population growth dynamics you'd see in a flask, and this is very reproducible across uh, uh, individual fish. So here we can really look at, at bacterial dynamics um, uh, in the entire um, uh, organ of the intestinal larva. Um, so this is a, a story that is the work of um, a very talented postdoctoral fellow, Travis Wiles, in my lab, and a, um, a great uh, former PhD student, Matt Jamalita, uh, a physics student in the laboratory of my colleague, Raghu Parthasarathi. And they were interested in looking at bacterial bacterial dynamics within the gut and looking in particular at two different commensal uh, bacteria, uh, an Aeromonas and a Vibrio species. And, um, and these are um, bacteria that reside and um, inhabit the gut in very different ways. So this, um, this Aeromonas here you can see is largely um, inhabiting these clumps, um, very few planktonic cells, whereas the Vibrio is um, almost essentially entirely planktonic, very fast moving cells within this environment. And what um, Travis observed is that if you put these together, the Aeromonas is in purple is displaced by the Vibrio shown uh, in blue. And so this is a, a, a whoops, paradigm where you can actually, um, uh, the, the, the Aeromonas is initially uh, introduced and then the Vibrio is, is introduced after the Aeromonas reaches carrying capacity and the Vibrio can displace the Aeromonas. And um, the, these, um, uh, Aram, these, maybe I'll go back one more just to play the movie again. Um, so you can see that this Aeromonas population is displaced uh, in a very dramatic fashion. It's, it's, it's just uh, uh, you know, um, physically uh, this large clump of, of these pink bacteria are extruded from the gut. So this is um, implying some very uh, dynamic um, uh, changes in, in population uh, sizes uh, in very short periods of time. Um, we can uh, uh, measure that in real time using our, uh, this, this microscopy, this is light sheet imaging where you can see um, the population of the Vibrio stays steady and the, this Vibrio 
this air monus will have these dramatic collapses. We can also characterize that um, using um, standard mycological plating, and that gives us you know, very good statistics on, on large population sizes. And you can see that um, over time, as the, um, uh, uh, when the um, Aeromonas is on its own, it can reach high um, carrying capacities. But when it's uh, in the presence of the Sphere over time, the population will collapse. And so we could actually model this, um, this very simple um, mathematical models of logistic growth with uh, just randomly introduced Poisson collapses, where we're then uh, modeling the collapse strength and frequency um, and, and can parameterize those based on these different types of data. And what's very interesting is that those two very different types of data um, are consistent with the models that we build, and so that, that um, gives us strong confidence in this model. And it also tells us that then that parameters that would influence collapse frequency and strength could be really important in the spectral bacterial competition. And so um, an experiment that we did to test that was to use a mutant zebrafish host that um, lacks, it has a mutation in the RET gene, it lacks proper maturation of its enteric nervous system and has defective peristalsis. And um, in these uh, uh, animals, just to, to remind you that um, in a wild-type host, the Aeromonas population is really displaced by the, the Vibrio, but in a RET mutant, now um, the Aeromonas population persists. So this, this is telling us then that the host environment, in this case peristalsis, is really contributing to this bacterial-bacterial uh, competition that we can see. And, and this competition is one that um, you know, we really had to understand by looking um, in real time and understanding how these bacteria are inhabiting that environment very differently. This Aeromonas that uh, lives in these large clumps is very susceptible to peristaltic waves, whereas the um, Vibrio that is existing in this planktonic lifestyle is much more resilient to those, those changes. So um, finally, I want to tell you about how we can use the germ-free animals as sort of a platform to take advantage of the potential for doing, um, uh, exploring early development of our fish, and then also using the high throughput capacities of our system to, um, to really discover some new microbial activities um, that uh, impact development. Um, so this is a story that has to do with the development of the insulin-producing population of beta cells in the pancreas. And um, this is work of a really fantastic graduate student in my lab, uh, Jennifer Hampton Hill, who um, came to the lab and she was very interested in the impact of uh, the microbiota on uh, development in general. And in particular, she was interested in the development of the pancreas. And um, she was savvy to the fact that the pancreatic development uh, occurs at a time that's relevant to the establishment of the microbiota. So um, these, uh, um, the, 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 these fish, um, they have a very early, ra uh, a rapid early development, and so um, they're uh, fertilized within an essentially sterile chorion or eggshell, um, and that's the, what we surface sterilize to generate germ-free animals. They would normally develop it in this environment and then hatch out of those eggshells between two and three days. And at three days, they already hatch out with a functional pancreas with a single islet of beta cells that will support the metabolic needs of this animal. And then over the next three days, as the animal grows, that beta cell population will expand in size and about double in number. At the same time, um, these animals are now in uh, uh, encountering their microbial environment. They, by four days, they have a patent gut tube, and we see colonization um, and a robust uh, uh, bacterial microbial community assembled uh, by five days. So what Jennifer did was to look at the, the population size of beta cells in germ-free animals um, as compared to conventional animals at, at that six-day time point, and she made use of a transgenic a zebrafish line expressing GFP under the insulin promoter, and she saw that in the germ-free state, there are many fewer beta cells. And what one sees is that actually it's um, this expansion that fails to happen. So in conventionally reared animals, there's this doubling of beta cell population. Um, in the germ-free state, that um, number same static. And this has metabolic consequences for the fish. So the germ-free fish have 
a higher uh, circulating glucose level relative uh, to the conventionally reared animals. So she next asked, could we reverse this germ-free trait with any of our bacterial isolates in our curated collections? And she focused on ones that could robustly colonize um, the zebrafish intestine, and she found um, that there are certain, uh, sorry, certain strains that um, could, uh, in mono association, some Aeromonas and Eschewinella strain, that could reverse this paucity of beta cells, uh, and other strains did not. Um, she then went on to uh, show that um, these Aeromona strains produced a secreted factor that could do this, so she could add just cell-free supernatant from these different Aeromona strains um, to germ-free animals, and that was sufficient to reverse this. Um, we also, she, she showed that if you uh, treat that cell-free supernatant with protonase K, that destroys the activity, so suggesting it's a protease, a uh, protein. And, um, and then um, she looked in an Aeromona strain that lacked type 2 secretion system, and that still had the activity, so that told us that even a much less complex cell-free supernatant had this activity. So she went on then to um, perform ammonium sulfate fractionation of this material um, and found a, a high salt fraction that had a, a enriched uh, activity. And at that point then, we performed mass spec analysis on this material, uh, came up with 163 proteins, which is a lot to characterize, but she was able to go back to the bacterial genomes of the isolates that we had and ask which of these pr uh, proteins were predicted to be found in the genomes that had the capacity to expand beta cells and which were absent in the ones that didn't. Um, and that returned one predicted protein. And I said to Jennifer, there's no way that this is actually going to work out the way we, we think. Um, but sure enough, she had cloned and purified that protein, added it to germ-free fish, and was able to expand the beta cell mass of those germ-free fish. So we've uh, named this protein um, Bethe for um, beta cell expansion factor. And, um, and what it's telling us then is that this is a very specific protein that has a capacity to impact a, a very important aspect of development um, of, of the animal. And, and um, we've gone on to now ask, well, where else can you find bethe like proteins? And um, we find um, more uh, closely related homologs and other um, vibrios and aeromonas. Importantly, it's not found in all Vibrio genomes. So, for example, our commensal Vibrio didn't have this Bethe, didn't have the activity. Um, we see one example, um, which is clearly an example of a um, horizontal transfer of this to a gene in Enterococcus scallionum. If we sort of expand our, um, our search space, so now um, this uh, cluster here is just a small cluster, and we, we expand out to more distant home logs, we do see some other examples of human gut-associated bacteria, um, Enterobacter, Klebsiella, and Escherichia, that also have um, uh, Bethe homologs. And so we, um, she went ahead and uh, cloned in, uh, uh, these, these other uh, uh, examples and used those to treat our germ-free fish, and those uh, human gut uh, bacterial-associated proteins also have the capacity to expand uh, Bethe, uh, the beta cells in our germ-free fish. Um, and so, I, you know, I think this is interesting when we think about um, how um, uh, the um, beta cell um, expansion occurs in humans. There's, in, uh, in fact, um, a very uh, profound early uh, neonatal period of expansion and, and division of these cells um, within the, f the first uh, year of life or so, and then that, um, those, that cell division becomes more quiescent. And that's happening concurrent with the establishment of the gut microbiota. So this might really be an important critical window of exposure to particular gut microbial products. Uh, so I just want to um, end then by saying that the, the known Ryag zebrafish model is really useful for performing experiments where you want to uh, have large populations with defined environments and looking at things like microbiota transmission. Um, it's, it's, uh, the optical transparency is really great for being able to look at questions about uh, microbiota dynamics. And then um, the early uh, accessible uh, 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 development and um, the fact that we can work at very large scales using large numbers um, of, of animals um, allows us to define um, discover uh, new microbial activities. And so um, finally, I'd just like to acknowledge um, 
all the people in my lab, um, colleagues at the Meta Center for Systems Biology at the University of Oregon, and other imp important colleagues, and, and those who I've mentioned um, are in yellow. I'd be happy to take questions. Thanks.